Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Tonight's tale, part one of The Harbor Master by Robert W. Chambers. Because it all seems so improbable, so horribly impossible to me now, sitting here safe and sane in my own library, I hesitate to record an episode which already appears to me less horrible than grotesque. Yet, unless this story is written now, I know I shall never have the courage to tell the truth about the matter. Not from fear of ridicule, but because I myself shall, shall soon cease to credit what I now know to be true. Yet scarcely a month has elapsed since I heard the stealthy purring of what I believed to be the shoaling undertow. Scarcely a month ago, with my own eyes, I saw that which even now I am beginning to believe never existed. As for the harbor master and the blow I'm now striking at the old order of things, but of that I shall not speak now, or later. I shall try to tell the story simply and truthfully and let my friends testify as to my probity and the publishers of this book to corroborate them. On the 29th of February, I resigned my position under the government and left Washington to accept an offer from Professor Farrago, whose name he kindly permits me to use, and on the first day of April I entered upon my new and congenial duties as General Superintendent of the Waterfowl Department connected with the Zoological Gardens then in course of erection at the Bronx Park of New York. For a week, I followed the routine, examining the new foundations, studying the architect's plans, following the surveyors through the Bronx thickets, suggesting arrangements for water courses and pools destined to be included in the enclosures for swans, geese, pelicans, herons, and such of the waders and swimmers as we might expect to acclimate in the Bronx Park. It was at that time the policy of the trustees and officers of the zoological gardens neither to employ collectors nor to send out expeditions in search of specimens. The society decided to depend upon voluntary contributions, and I was always busy part of the day in dictating answers to correspondents who wrote offering their services as hunters of big game, collectors of all sorts of fauna, trappers, snarers, and also those who offered specimens for sale, usually at exorbitant rates, to the proprietors of five-legged kittens, mangy lynxes, moth-eaten coyotes, and dancing bears, I returned courteous but uncompromising refusals, of course submitting all such letters together with my replies to Professor Farrago. One day, Towards the end of May, however, just as I was leaving Bronx Park to return to town, Professor Lassard of the Reptilian Department called out to me that Professor Farrago wanted to see me a moment. So I put my pipe into my pocket again and retraced my steps to the temporary wooden building occupied by Professor Farrago, General Superintendent of the Zoological Gardens. The professor, who was sitting at his desk before a pile of letters and replies submitted for approval by me, pushed his glasses down and looked over them at me with a whimsical smile that suggested amusement, impatience, annoyance, and perhaps a faint trace of apology. Now here's a letter, he said with a deliberate gesture toward a sheet of paper impaled on a file. A letter that I suppose you will remember. He disengaged the sheet of paper and handed it to me. Oh, yes, I replied with a shrug. Of course, the man is mistaken, or... Or what? demanded Professor Farrago, tranquilly wiping his glasses. Or a liar, I replied. After a short silence, he leaned back in his chair and bade me read the letter to him again, and I did so with a contemptuous tolerance for the writer who must have been either a very innocent victim or a very stupid swindler. 
I said as much to Professor Farrago, but to my surprise, he appeared to waver. I suppose, he said with his nearsighted, embarrassed smile, that 999 men in a thousand would throw that letter aside and condemn the writer as a liar or fool. In my opinion, yes, said I. He's one or the other. He isn't in mine, said the professor placidly. What? I exclaimed. Here is a man living all alone on a strip of rock and sand between the wilderness and the sea who wants you to send someone to take charge of a bird that doesn't exist. How do you know, asked Professor Farrago, that the bird in question does not exist? It's a generally accepted fact, I replied sarcastically, that the great auk has been extinct for years. Therefore, I may be pardoned for doubting that our correspondent possesses a pair of them alive. Oh, young fellows, said the professor, smiling warily, you embark on a theory for destinations that don't exist. He leaned back in his chair, his amused eyes searching space for the imagery that made him smile. Like swimming squirrels, you navigate the help of heaven and a stiff breeze, but you never land where you hope to, do you? Rather red in the face, I said, don't you believe the great auk to be extinct? Audubon saw the great auk. Who has seen a single specimen since? Nobody. Except our correspondent here, he replied laughing. I warily laughed too, considering the interview at an end, but the professor went on, coolly. Whatever it is that our correspondent has, and I am daring to believe that it is the great auk itself, I want you to secure it for the society. When my astonishment subsided, my first conscious sentiment was one of pity. Clearly, Professor Farrago was on the verge of dotage. Ah, what a loss that would be to the world. I believe now that Professor Farrago perfectly interpreted my thoughts, but he betrayed neither resentment nor impatience as I drew up a chair beside his desk. There was nothing to do but obey, and this fool's errand was none of my conceiving. Together we made out a list of articles necessary for me and itemized their expenses and others I might incur, and I set a date for my return, allowing no margin for a successful termination to the expedition. Oh, never mind that, said the professor. What I want you to do is get those birds here safely. Now, how many men will you take? None, I replied bluntly. It's a useless expense unless there is something to bring back. If there is, I will wire you, you may be sure. Very well, said the professor, good-humoredly. You shall have all the assistance you may require. Can you leave tonight? The old gentleman was certainly prompt. I nodded, half sulkily, aware of his amusement. So... I said, picking up my hat. I am to start north to find a place called Black Harbor where there is a man named Halyard who possesses, among other household utensils, two extinct great ox. We were both laughing by this time. I asked him why on earth he credited the assertion of a man that he'd never before heard of. I suppose, he replied with the same half-apologetic, half-humorous smile, it is instinct. I feel somehow that this man, Halyard, has got an auk, perhaps two. I can't get away from the idea that we are on the eve of acquiring the rarest of living creatures. It's odd for a scientist to talk as I do. Doubtless you're shocked. Go on, admit it now. But I was not shocked. On the contrary, I was conscious that the same strange hope that Professor Farrago cherished was beginning, in spite of me, 
to stir my pulses too. If he has, I began, then stopped. The professor and I looked hard at each other in the silence. Go on, he said encouragingly. But I had nothing more to say, for the prospect of beholding with my own eyes a living specimen of the great auk produced a series of conflicting emotions within me which rendered speech profanely superfluous. As I took my leave, Professor Farago came to the door of the temporary wooden office and handed me the letter written by the man Halyard. I folded it and put it into my pocket, as Halyard might require it for my own identification. How much does he want for the pair? I asked. Ten thousand dollars. Don't demur. If the birds are really... I know, I said hastily, not daring to hope too much. One thing more, said Professor Farago gravely. You know, in that last paragraph of the letter, Halyard speaks of something else in the way of specimens, an undiscovered species of amphibious biped. Just read that paragraph again, will you? I drew the letter from my pocket and read as he directed. When you have seen two living specimens of the great auk and have satisfied yourself that I tell you the truth, you may be wise enough to listen without prejudice to a statement that I shall make concerning the existence of the strangest creature ever fashioned. I will merely say at this time that the creature referred to is an amphibious biped that inhabits the ocean near this coast. More I cannot say, for I personally have not seen the animal, but I have a witness who has. For there are many who affirm that they, too, have seen the creature. You will naturally say that my statement amounts to nothing, but when your representative arrives, if he be free from prejudice, I expect his reports to you concerning this sea biped will confirm the solemn statements of a witness I know to be unimpeachable. Yours truly, Burton Halyard, Black Harbor. Well, I said after a moment's thought, here goes for the wild goose chase. Wild auk, you mean, said Professor Farago, shaking hands with me. You will start tonight, won't you? Yes, but heaven knows how I'm ever going to land in this man Halyard's dooryard. Goodbye. About the sea biped, began Professor Farago shyly. Oh, don't, I said. I can swallow the ox, feathers and claws, but if this fellow Halyard is hinting he's seen an amphibious creature resembling a man or a woman, said the professor cautiously, uh, I retired disgusted, my faith shaken in the mental vigor of my employer. And so the horrible hunt for the supposed snipe begins. We will continue next time, and until then, stay scary, my wildlings, and make the most of your nights.